Um, so lecture two, which will be in three parts, starting with this one, which is quite a long title. Um, okay, so what we're going to talk about, we're going to talk a little bit about errors, uh, the importance of significant figures, particularly when you quote an answer, and accuracy and precision. Okay, so we all make mistakes. We can make individual errors, perhaps from lack of experience, or we can just knock the ball over at the wrong time. Uh, we may not handle perhaps a pipette correctly, as we'll see in a slide coming up. There are always issues associated with instrumentation and reagents. They don't go down to an infinite level of precision. There's always a margin of error. And there may be issues with the method. And here's an example of a classic of an error being designed into a, a process. When cash machines first appeared, the process was you insert your card, give it your code, tell how much money you want, you get your money back, and then you get your card back. So of course what was happening, what happened was people would get the money and then walk off, leaving their card in the machine, uh, perhaps for the next lucky person or the next honest person. Uh, so these days, of course, when you get your when you've completed the process of entering your code and telling saying how much money you want, you get your card back, then you get your money. Which is a much more logical way of doing it. Uh, as I mentioned, there are errors which are associated with the way we do things. There's a table error of pipette errors, 55% of them human errors. You could argue that liquid sticking to the tip is also human error because people aren't noticing it. And a range of other things um, which, which conspire to, make, to impose a certain margin of error on the use of gills and pipettes in this case. There's a picture of a glass pipette there. Uh, for those of you who haven't used glass pipettes, it's basically a glass tube with a line scored around it, which if you fill it with liquid to that line, so the bottom of the meniscus of the liquid is touching the line, it exact, is exactly, in this case, 10 mils, 10.00 mils to four significant figures. Now, many years ago, uh, as a chap who used to work at British Steel, which is down the road, uh, and one of his jobs was to do titrometric analysis of steel, and after a while, customers kind of saying, well, the specification of steel appears to be a bit off. And people scratched their heads and they couldn't figure out what was going on. So until somebody sat there and watched this guy doing his job, and it turned out that what he was doing was instead of filling the pipette up to the line that's got around it, he's filling the pipette up to the decimal point, which is a purely arbitrary placement of the decimal point. Different pipettes, it'll be in, in different places. I don't know about this guy, but he'd been doing this for a considerable amount of time. Uh, here's one you often see. You've got a series of standards, and you get them in the wrong order. So when you plot them, uh, perhaps you do a HPL analysis. See, one of, them, one of them's just not on the straight line. And it's because, basically, you've mixed up the standards. It it's, it's happens more often than you would perhaps imagine. Uh, and the, me and the technician will say, well, we know what's gone wrong here. And the student say, no, 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 it can't be possibly that. But it often is. That's, it's just a basic error which can happen. You've labelled a, label a sample in the wrong order. They've gone into the auto sample in the wrong order. This sort of thing can't happen. But then there can be situations like this where we've got perhaps possible contamination. Uh, one of the things we always recognise is you never return things to a bottle. You've taken a stand out. You don't put it back in the stock bottle. Because if you're doing it, contamination, which can affect the standards and have a knock-on effect. So again, a sort of individual error, I guess. Then there's random errors. Uh, we design equipment, we design methods to reduce these, but they can't be predicted and can't be removed completely. They can be plus or minus, so over time we'll, we'll sort of even out. And that'll be, we'll come back to that again when we talk a little bit later on about what we call residuals. Um, we mitigate this by doing repeated measurements in the sample and taking key statistics such as the mean and the standard deviation, which is, will tell us the average of the sample, of course, and how spread out the results for a given sample are. Yeah, here's a, a key thing which is important uh, when you're reporting results. Uh, results are meaningless without an estimation of error. So here's a burette. Uh, it's a 50 mil burette, it's calibrated in 0.1 of a mil divisions. Now, a good analyst can estimate the volume down to 0 0.01 mils. Uh, in practice, maybe 0 0.05 would be sort of between two divisions would be what most people could do. But for example, a good analyst would then quote his or her results as, my reading was 48.75 plus or minus 0 0.01 mL. Um, how much this would be, of course, depends on the equipment 
this can be very much higher or very much lower depending on the type of technique you're using. But it's always something to bear in mind. And here's one, one thing which often comes up. Uh, in the food lab, we have analytical balances, which read the four decimal places. And we have food, kitchen scales, which read the one decimal place. Uh, so we can see there that we can get a, a weight on the analytical balance to six significant figures, whereas on the uh, kitchen scales, we're going to get three significant figures. So again, that's something to bear in mind. You couldn't, for example, report the weight you record from the kitchen scales as 12.5000, for example. It can only be 12.5. In this case, it's plus or minus 0.1 compared to a much narrower margin for the analytical balance. Yeah, I mentioned significant figures. Uh, this is, again, something we see sometimes in students reporting results. They've had content with a long, a long tail of decimal points, most of which really can't be justified. It's okay to uh, keep these decimal points going through when you do your calculations, but ultimately it comes down to what is the metric we have used with the lowest number of significant figures. Here's a calculation. Uh, we've weighed the sample to four decimal places, but we've weighed the fat we get from it only to two decimal places for various reasons associated with the method. And when we do the calculation, we round it down to three significant figures, which is what we found from the weight of the fat. So 3.51% rather than the number with a long trail of decimal places. Uh, yeah, and that's where it comes from. That's the, the, the 0 0.16 is the most smallest number of significant figures, so that must influence what our final number of significant figures are. So fairly straightforward, uh, but something to bear in mind. Okay, accuracy and precision. Um, this is the metaphor you'll always see if you search for accuracy and position, you'll always find the dartboards. Uh, there's a couple of definitions there, which are the sort of things which are examinable. Uh, and th th these are quite good. Uh, the center of the target is a true value, and then we can consider whether these particular clusters of four darts, which seems to be cheating, you normally need three darts, uh, are accurate, precise, or neither, or both. Uh, so here's a little exercise for you to do. Um, I'll pause the video for a second. Uh, but virtually anyway, you can pause the video. Uh, I'll hum softly, then you can come back and we'll have a look at what it is you've concluded about these particular dartboards. Okay, we'll pause now. Right, we're back. Uh, hopefully you've had a think about that. Uh, so here's what the answers are. So the first one's neither accurate nor precise. Going down to the bottom one, which is both accurate and precise, We'll notice the one that's third from the top. We, we take it as give it being accurate because if you take the average of the four darts, the more or less than the bullseye. But of course, they aren't very precise because they aren't very close to each other. Um, but by coincidence, I guess as much as anything, the accuracy is quite close to the real value. Uh, dart bots are fine, uh, but they aren't really very helpful in terms of reporting results. Uh, so there are things we can do. The average is, is, is useful, especially if you know the true value of something, which isn't often true for food analysis, of course. Food, as we've talked about a lot, is very heterogeneous. Uh, so the value of vitamin C in an orange can be different from orange to orange in the same batch, let alone ones from different parts of the world. Uh, so the true value is useful if you can find it. We're more likely to look at the standard deviations, how far the results are apart from each other. So for example, we do in the vitamin C analysis, we do it in triplicate, and then we look at the standard deviation. But then we can also look at something called the relative standard deviation, which we're going to talk about in a, uh, another of the lectures that's coming up in this, this particular subset of lectures. Uh, now there is a, a tutorial here for you to do, uh, associated with that particular Excel spreadsheet, which is referenced at the bottom of the slide. Uh, and this is what we do. Um, it's just a, a little work through in terms of considering whether things are accurate, precise, uh, precise or imprecise. Okay. Right, I think that's probably it for this. Okay, yeah, so there is a, yeah, there's, there's two questions there actually. Um, where you're doing some calculation and parameters and comment the accuracy and precision of analysis. analysis. It's all explained in the spreadsheets. Okay, that's all for now, folks. Thanks for that, and that was the end of part one.